This session is being hosted to you by the Philadelphia Area Space Alliance, and I'm Michelle Baker, the president. really great speakers and you will need your hands to applaud them, I trust. I know that's going to happen. In Spanish, que pasa means what's happening. And that's what you're going to find out today. We're here to tell you what's happening in space. This first session is going to be an overview. You're going to hear generally what's happening regarding asteroids. At 3 p.m., as is not on this schedule, but as was in the program book, we're going to have Bob Farquhar from the NEAR Project. He's going to tell us what's happening up in space regarding asteroids. And at 4 p.m., we're going to have Tom Garrels from Space Watch, who is going to be telling us what's happening right here on Earth. We're going to tie it up then at 5 p.m. with Alan Willoughby, who's going to give us a future vision. A little housekeeping, number one, since, to keep things in order, I'd like you to hold your questions until the end of each presentation. We will have a question and answer period. If you have a notepad and pens available, we do not want to lose your questions by any means. They're very important to us, but please hold them until the very end of each session. Our first speakers today who are going to give us the overview are members of CASA and my personal friends. It's Don, Dr. Donald Cox and Mr. James Chestick. Don Cox was NASA's first space science lecturer. He's already published 10 books, more than 10 books on space. And they have a book that's coming out this fall called Doomsday Asteroids, Can We Survive? The title is rather foreboding, but I assure you, you're going to hear about the promise of asteroids as well as the peril. Sometimes titles are picked more by the publisher for attention. The content of the book is both. Our other, his co-author, is Mr. James Chestick. Who has he is retired GE Aerospace Engineer and has been in aerospace engineering for 38 years. Mr. Chestick has worked in a variety of programs. He won the highest GE Division uh, Space Division Award for mission, one of his mission concepts to Mars. His work has included concepts for solar panels and advanced Earth observation and as well as proposals for a Mars lander, a lunar robot, and a solar probe. So without further ado, I ask you to warmly welcome our first speaker, Mr. Donald Cox. Yesterday, a strange thing happened up in space. An asteroid, 1996 J JG, whizzed by the Earth at a mere 1.9 million miles. It was three quarters of a mile wide and packed a punch of a million atomic bombs. But it missed us. It was discovered just a week earlier by a professor of astronomy at a New South Wales, Australia observatory. Just a week before that, some, some students, astronomy students, who Tom Gerald's knows well, at the University of Arizona on Mount Lemmon discovered another asteroid, 1996 JA1. This was only a third of a mile in diameter, but traveling at 36,000 miles, but it came within moon distance of the Earth, 278,000 miles, missing us. And we had two whoops from those who were happy to know that they had missed us. Now, suddenly asteroids are a hot topic, or we wouldn't have four hours on them today. But here we are. And we go back in time to the famous European astronomer of a few centuries ago, Johannes, Johannes Kepler, who was doing astronautical units between the planets from the sun. And he stumbled after Mars. Mars and Jupiter, he wrote, I put a planet. 
that there was no planet there. It was missing. He knew between Jupiter and Saturn there was no planet because the astronautical unit was right and on to Neptune and the rest. But where was that missing planet? Unfortunately, he went to his death and he couldn't find out because they didn't have telescopes enough until 1800, January, when they discovered the first major asteroid, Ceres, named after an Italian goddess, which is only a thousand miles wide. <laughs> but Ceres, which is as big as the state of Texas, if it hit us, we could kiss the world goodbye. Now we go back in time, and we know a million atomic bombs could wipe out most of civilization with just one hit. We now know that in 65 million years ago, in Chicxulub, Yucatan, and we now have the proof, the crater, an asteroid probably a mile wide or a kilometer wide hit, and it killed off the dinosaurs. But it was only in recent years that we discovered the proof. Now, 30 years ago, I had the pleasure of writing a book called Islands in Space. And just before lunch, I had the pleasure of autographing a copy for a young physics teacher who wants to write a book on my late, or write a profile on my late co-author, Dandridge Cole, who unfortunately passed away 20 years ago. And in that book, we made the proposition, we had a forward by Willie Lay, that the continents were the planets. And the asteroids, which are between Mars and Jupiter, were islands. And that these asteroids, we now know there's 300 of them, Earth-crossing asteroids. There's another 2,000 out there, at least 2,000, that we haven't discovered yet. And these are the ones that we have to worry about. But as we wrote in our book, we ought to get interested in the asteroids, because even though they're small, planets. They offer a lot, and you'll hear it for the rest of the afternoon from my co-author and from Tom Geralds, on mining them, capturing them, uh, colonizing them. And the new book, which will be out, some of you have the flyers for discount copies, will be available shortly, uh, is divided into four parts. One is uh, an overview of our knowledge of asteroids, how we got to know about them. Two is capturing and uh, searching for them, which we have begun. Three is colonizing of these minor planets, or planetoids as they are also called. And four, an analysis of whether cosmic cooperation between the nations can, can come on the table so we can do the search and detection and deflection jointly and not apart. Now back in 1973, Arthur Clarke, a good friend of many of ours, wrote a, a seminal novel called Rendezvous with Rama. And in that book, 23 years ago, he postulated that one day in the fall of 2077, an asteroid would come over Europe and plunk down in northern Italy, wiping out the towns of Verona and Venice and Padua and killing 600,000 people. A lot of critics made fun of Arthur Clarke, but he's been proved right. We saw him yesterday on TV where he said, I made a mistake on 2001. He had Pan American taking us to the moon, but now he's changed to TWA because Pan American went bust. Anyway, Clark came up with a thought for a solution. We need a space guard program, worldwide space guard program, to look out for asteroids. This was 23 years ago. And so the new American program, which is in its infancy, is called Space Guard Survey, to at least detect them. And so it goes. Now, just a month ago in the New York Times, <clears throat> April 21st, a reprint of the authoritative journal Nature postulates on the question, could an Earth-crossing asteroid, a 
which we have 300 known, come in, one like Eros, come in and hit us and do major damage, maybe wiping out a few cities. But that wasn't alone. We also have the question that we knew that back in 1908, we now have proof, years later, that a major asteroid hit in the unpopulated section of Siberia known as the Tunguska Forest. And we now have photographs, you've seen them, of trees knocked over like matchsticks from the center where the asteroid hit. Fortunately, there were no cities there and no people lost their lives. But we had a scare. That was in this century. So what we've examined, what we've tried to do in our book, and you'll hear more about it later, is to enlighten the public on new Tunguska Chicxulub threats to our civilization. Now I, told, I bring you back to another New York Times story, April 26th of this year. Headline, Chinese seek out of option to fend off asteroids. And just before signing a new nuclear arms treaty in Geneva, the Chinese uh, president, Jiang Zemin, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are aware, we Chinese, a new nuclear power, are aware of the asteroid threat. We're not ready to sign this this nuclear, anti-nuclear treaty until we look into the killer asteroids. This made page one of the Times. And this is something that we have to all be concerned about because China has put the issue on the table when none of the other space powers would talk about it. So China gets credit for making us concerned about detection and deflection of killer asteroids. And Finally, before I turn it over to my co-author, um, I had one other point that I've lost myself in, but it'll come back to me a little later. Oh, here it is. That um, a recent COPE, COPE is our term for a cosmic object threatening the Earth, that six years before Shoemaker or Shoemaker Levy 9 splashed down on Jupiter. An asteroid 1989 FC, a little less than one mile in diameter, zipped past the Earth's orbit just six hours, six hours after our planet was there. This came to light this year, and it passed by um, very close, but it triggered, it wasn't this year, it was last year, an AIA position paper, which motivated Congress to have NASA conduct two workshops, one on detection of NEOs and the other on their interception. The first one, and I'm sorry about my date, stand corrected, this was April 90, that we detected this asteroid. Uh, no, it was 1989. Uh, you can check out my dates. But the American Institute of Astronautics said that we should, they got an, a workshop going, and it resulted in the first low course space guard survey monitored between the astronomers and NASA. But no agreement was reached on the more contentious subject of interception, which you'll hear about from my co-author, how to destroy or deflect these intruders. In past several years, there have been abortive attempts by NASA and several scientific groups to begin this space guard survey, including the Air Force's planetary defense mission study, which I'll refer to when I come back for the close-up. And another workshop in May 95 in the AIA position paper to get this space show in, into front page and onto the front burner. I'd now like to turn this over to my co-author, Jim Chestek will talk about the detection, the deflection, and then I'll be back for a few closing words. Jim. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, <clears throat> coming out to hear us talk about a new frontier, a limitless frontier in deep space. I hope to convince you that we can use this threat <clears throat> of asteroids to motivate ourselves to move out 
and get a program of space exploration and colonization. I'm a frontiersman at heart. I want humans to go out and mine the asteroids and colonize them, both colonies there and elsewhere in space. That's why I'm wearing Western attire today. It reminds me of the Western frontier, the last frontier Americans faced. We're a frontier people by heart. That's where we, that's where we got our national character. And we're in danger of losing that national character if we don't maintain a frontier to explore. We're in danger of succumbing to timidity, bureaucracy, and conformity. I already see signs of that. First, I want to talk about the peril of the asteroids. I believe that peril, oh wait, I got another thought. Don mentioned islands in space. When 30 years ago, when Don and Dan Cole were writing that book, I was working in my office down the hall from Dan Cole on a mission plan for probe to deep space. That plan called for a flight through the asteroid belt and around Jupiter to fling the probe out of the solar system. That probe was later built by a competing company, who shall remain nameless, uh, but, and flown by NASA as Pioneer 10. That was the first man-made object to fly through the asteroid belt. It did encounter Jupiter and was flown out of the solar system, being the first to leave the solar system. Now I want to start by talking about the peril. I believe that peril is more immediate than many of you believe if you've been following the media. The media and astronomers like to talk about the big one, an impact so big it will wipe, wipe out all human beings the way the one that Chicks love wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But that event is so unlikely that it shouldn't concern us. An event like that, that happens once in an eon. An event like Tunguska happens much more often. Okay, this shows that there are something like a thousand objects, the size of a kilometer or greater. What the media does not tell us is that there are a million objects the size of Tunguska. So it's a thousand times more likely that we'll have a Tunguska than a dinosaur event. The estimate that we'll get a, a one kilometer object is something like once every hundred thousand years. Therefore, to get an object of Tunguska size is likely to happen once every 100 years or so. Well, Tunguska was in 1908, so any time now. This one kilometer event makes a nice news story. It will estimate it will kill a quarter of the human people, human population, and many other things as well. So it makes a nice news story, but it doesn't scare anybody very much. So we don't, so we tend not to take it very seriously. The good news about the Tunguska size events is there are lots of deserted places where it could hit. The bad news is it's likely to hit an ocean. If it hits an ocean, it can raise a tidal wave that would devastate coastal cities and kill millions of people. <laughs> <clears throat> Everyone agrees that the first step to avoiding a planetary disaster is to find these objects. The human race is doing a very, very poor job of this. There are only a handful of astronomers actively looking for these objects. Tom Garrels, who's going to speak to us later, is one of the pioneers in that area. We need to devote a lot more effort to that kind of activity. And may I Okay, thank you. One of the problems in finding these asteroids is that they spend so much of their time in the daylight sky. This slide shows the main belt asteroids, the orbit of Earth in there, and the orbit of a typical Apollo asteroid. Note that it's going to impact the Earth there. A month later, it's over there, nicely in the midnight sky, where you can easily see it. But then it's too late to, de to deflect it. We need time to get there, and we need time to deflect it. We'd like to have about six months, 
to mount an effective defense against this kind of thing. But let's look where things are six months earlier. Earth is over there, and the asteroid is up there. The asteroid is on the sun side of Earth, so we can't possibly see it with a daylight, with a Earth-based telescope. So our best bet at present is to see it there and hope it misses us on that revolution. This is what the present uh, asteroid detection program is based upon. Until we have a catalog of all these myriad of small objects, we can be blindsided with little warning. And I think everyone would agree it's going to take too many years to catalog all of them down to the Tunguska size, since there's so many of them. It seems to me it would be a, a different approach, a space-based telescope. Can I have the next slide, please, Tom? My suggestion is to place a telescope in Earth orbit there, so that it's three months ahead of Earth in orbit, so that for the six months object, it's going to look out there and see it. This telescope is in a space black sky. It's where it can see the object because it's looking away from the sun, and it's a lot closer to the object, so you have a much better chance of getting a warning. Now note, this does not need to be a multi-billion dollar Hubble space telescope. A member of the Space Studies Institute in England has proposed a much cheaper million dollar class space telescope, which he calls the Humble Space Telescope. Such a telescope, I believe, could be built and would serve very adequately as an early warning sensor or a planetary defense system. What can we do if we have some warning? Well, we can deflect the object. I'm going to describe two cases, the short warning case and the years of warning case. First, the war first warning, short warning case. Can we have the next slide, Tom? This shows the only way we have of doing it. We impart a velocity there which deflects the trajectory away from the Earth so it misses us. If we have a month from there to there, we can def do the deflection of about five meters per second. If we have two months, we can do it with half that velocity. But how can you put five meters a second onto a million ton object? It isn't easy. If you do it with a conventional rocket, it would take 1,500 tons of propellant. We can't put that in interplanetary space anytime soon. But a 10 to 40 kiloton nuclear bomb will also do the trick. And we, that would only weigh 100 pounds or so. We could do that. You could probably replace the instruments on near and do it with that spacecraft. Now, how does that work? Here's the bomb. There's the object to be deflected. The bomb explodes not on, but near the object. Don Minson, we call these things cosmic objects selecting cosmic objects threatening Earth, or cooties. <laughs> uh, so the bomb superheats the surface of the, of the asteroid, or the comet as the case may be, blows off some material, either as fragments or as vapor. That shoves the rock this way and deflects it away from Earth. Note, it is important not to shatter the object, but simply to shove it. If we shatter it, we'll get more impact, and that's worse than any one big impact. The next point I want to make is that it takes some time to do all this. For, depending on the, the payload and the rock and the launcher, it may take you several months to launch and get to the asteroid and have enough deflection time. So we need to add some time to that to deflect, to, to detect the cootie, sound the alarm, get people to pay attention, prepare a launch and do it, and you need six months, is my contention. The other approach involves sending a crew of astronauts to the asteroid, typically to set up a solar power plant and drive ion engines or mass drivers or something to deflect the asteroid. I think that's a great idea. That's the beginning of space colonization. But at present, we're not even willing to think about such an idea. 
Let me mention comets in passing. They are a big, big problem in my, in my mind. They are, the ones we know about are bigger than this million ton asteroid I just described. They're moving much faster, so they pack a much bigger wall, and they are impossible to predict. By the time we see them crossing the orbit of Jupiter, they're no more than a year away. So we've got to find them quickly. We can't develop a catalog of all of them coming toward us the way we can hope to do with the asteroids. Finally, now I want to switch the focus to the promise of asteroids. The first point is that we need to know a lot more about these asteroids. For example, if they're a pile of rubble, the technique I just described to shove it away may not work, so we need to know that. But even more importantly, if we're going to use these as raw material, we need to know what they are. You may have heard of the promise that there are some of the asteroids contain billions of dollars worth of platinum. But which ones? We need prospectors, hundreds of them. If there's a million objects out there, a hundred objects, a hundred probes or two hundred probes is a small sample. And, and we just launched really the first asteroid probe this year in February. Dr. Farquhar is going to describe that as our next speaker. You may think I'm out of my mind to talk about a hundred asteroid probes in the near future. But bear in mind, I'm talking about doing this after we have cheap access to space. I get very annoyed when I hear NASA talking about reducing the cost of shuttle launches by 10% in the next few years. They need to reduce the cost of space launch by a factor of 10 times in the next few years. And I believe that can be done. And after we've done that, we need to go on and build another generation that will reduce the cost by 10 times again. When we get the cost down to 100 of what they are now, then planets, watch out. Here we come. So long as we have to carry all of our propellants, air, food, water, and everything else, wherever we go in the solar system, we're not going to do much colonization. We must learn to live off the land. I know that term to Robert Zubrin of the Mars Direct notion. But asteroids can be a major source of raw materials for our space civilization. We can use the metals to build our structures and silicon to build our electronics. We're going to need asteroid materials, probably water, for our rocket propellants as we move around, move about the solar system. Carbonation chronobites have up to 20% of water. We believe these come from the asteroids, so we can expect to find thousands of tons of water among the asteroids. We can use this as the fuel for our colonization effort. One of the places that we need lots of raw material is in system in space. So why not capture an asteroid into Earth orbit? Ridiculous? We don't think so. In fact, we propose to do just that, and we expect to be taken seriously. How could such a thing be done? First, pick the small one. It's got to have a suitable orbit, and it's got to have desirable raw materials. We, we describe a couple in our book out of a couple hundred we know about, so there are probably many more among the million objects out there. Two, nudge it with a nuclear bomb to bring it on an Earth grazing trajectory so it penetrates the atmosphere just a little bit. Three, you need controls to ensure that you get capture, not collision. And four, you need to raise parity out of the atmosphere. Once you've done that, you've got an asteroid in near Earth orbit. There it can be very, very useful. I propose a period of about a week for this high energy Earth orbit asteroid. If this material, if this asteroid has been selected so it has lots of water, we can use this as a, as a space base and fuel depot to go from Earth low Earth orbit to anywhere. First, we use the water to get us from low Earth orbit to the asteroid. Once on the asteroid, if you want material on Earth, a velocity of only 10 feet per 15 miles an hour will bring you back to the Earth entry trajectory. A slingshot can do that. If you want to build a solar power satellite, 3,000 miles an hour 
completely from the asteroid to geosynchronous orbit where we can go to our, our satellite. That's only 10% of what you need to go into Earth orbit. So we can do that. Now I want to describe how you can put a catapult on this million ton asteroid and use that to go to the moon and to Mars. A six mile long maglev train operating with 3G can send a spaceship to Mars. Once you're at Mars, you can capture in the Mars orbit using atmospheric braking or land on Mars. A shorter catapult will get you to the moon. At the moon, you'll need, you'll need to use rocket propellants to land at first. But later, we can use tethers or magnetic arrestors to simply a catapult operating in reverse. So that this kind of an asteroid can open up the solar system for our exploration. Next slide, please. <coughs> the last idea I wanted to describe is pretty far out. That's the idea of using an asteroid the way a glass blower uses a bubble to blow a long hollow cylinder inside of which you can build a space colony. This is a Roy Scarpa picture drawing of such a, a space colony. It will take the technology of the 21st century to do it. We believe it could be done. And it will enable us to build space colonies all over the solar system. In conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that asteroids can be our allies in the conquest of space and not just a menace. We need to make, take positive steps to make this come true. Now the question is how do we get to this position for the future? I want that Don Cox explain our ideas about that. Thank you, Jim. One point that Bob Zuber made this morning, by the way, he wrote a beautiful forward to our book. You all know who Bob is. Is that we've got to get a vision that, that the Earth is no longer our home. It's the solar system that's our home. And the solar system includes the planets, the comets, and the asteroids. Now, we don't have an international or even a national organization at present to track asteroids. We've got a lot of sporadic ad hoc organizations, uh, but we need a UN-sponsored umbrella of all the nations to do the job. And modeled after the birth of NASA, and you remember after the Sputnik shock, there was no NASA until we cobbled together the NACA, the Langley, the Ames, the JPL, the ABMA, Von Brown's outfit, and Cape Canaveral. And so NASA was born. So we have to do the same thing to get at the asteroids. Just think of what present government organizations, many of them homeless, could be put under an umbrella of an international asteroid tracking and deflection. First would come the homeless National Reconnaissance Office, a top secret office at Langley, co-run by DOD and CIA. It was done to, to survey and track Russian satellites, spy satellites. It's got a $6 billion surplus in its treasury, but no way to use it. We propose that that be the hub of a, and the National Security Agency all could be merged into an asteroid tracking and detection agency. This could be done just like NASA. And uh, in fact, Vice President Gore has just announced that why stop there? Let's turn the NRO and put them to work tracking, looking down instead of up. Tracking deserts, pollution of deltas, rivers, dust storms, and what have you. And this bears merit, but I say to Vice President Gore, let's look up the asteroids in the comics. Thirdly, uh, the intelligence agencies. Vice uh, President Clinton has just announced that he's ordered the Director of Central Intelligence and his, the Senate bill to merge all the various dozen intelligence agencies other than those that I just named, including the National Security Agency, the imagery and mapping agency, NIMA, and others. And so it goes. Now a small step took place last, last November when the Air Force secretly started Project NEEP using a telescope, and this was documented in the New York Times just a month ago, 
a telescope at Mount Haleakala, Hawaii, in Maui. And that telescope has been tracking asteroids in secret. And they have discovered four new ones, four new Earth-crossing asteroids in these few months. It's now come to light that Project NEAT is something that's been done top secret. And it's the first example of NASA and DOD cooperation on these threats from outer space. Very significant project need, but it's working on a measly budget of one million dollars a year. Now, the top, the AIAA, an organization Jim and I and many of you are members of, American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics, was so concerned, and then we turned this over for questions, that they came up with an editorial in their journal because of the prospects of our being, or some part of the world, being hit by a stray asteroid. And in the end of their editorial, last November, they wrote, if someday a large asteroid does strike the Earth, and we could have prevented it, but did not, then it will be the greatest abdication of responsibility in all of human history. Let me read that last line again. If someday an asteroid does strike the Earth, and we could have prevented it, but did not, then it will be the greatest abdication of responsibility in all of human history. That's why these next three hours, and I plead with you to stay in here, Tom, Gerald, and the others, are so important. Thank you very much. Excellent job, gentlemen. Oh, we're going to open it now to questions. Yes, sir. The question is, uh, what are some of the solutions? Deflecting a rubble pile, or in general? There are some fairly far out ideas of putting a net around it and trying to move it that way. Uh, I don't have much hope for that in the near term. In the, in the mid term, perhaps that will work. There is some reason to believe that the notion of a standoff bomb will be as good as anything we know of right now. Tom, um, do you have any amplification of that? Yes, I think that there would be for a menacing asteroid, always be precursor missions to find out that the people who want to fly as well as the other kind of inspection that it would be the dark object. If you have enough time, yes. That's an action we would take Do I have another question? Yes, sir. Um, this is about the asteroids. Assuming a lot of these are very friable, like common nuclei and, and the loosening of some of the asteroids, what you probably want is not one bomb, but a bunch of small bombs that all close together. The first bomb should break up the cluster with a, with a bunch of fragments. The fragments will start drifting apart. Before they drift apart too long, you want to keep the cluster of fragments the successive waves of, 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 of energy so that all those fragments are driven in the same direction as the cluster. So it would be probably like, uh, like, I don't know, 10 seconds apart, detonations, maybe 190 detonations. Okay, if I understand, what was your question, sir? Is that, does that, that, that sound like a reasonable? Okay, the comment, the comment that we've gotten so that you can all hear it is that rather than bombing the asteroid, you would want to have several waves of bombs so that if it does, it's friable, and it breaks into a lot of small asteroid lets, let's say, is this a viable idea to send up several bombs? Jim, you look like you're already in Yes, that's known as the shoot, book, shoot yeah. approach. Uh, that comes to us from missile defense technology. We've talked about that for a lot of years. Getting them there 10 seconds apart scares me, but in general, I think the notion of getting several there if you can, if you have the time and the launch resources to do that, is a good plan. The issue is, will you have enough launchers ready uh, when you have the warning? If you have a short warning, 
for the long, for the immediate, intermediate warning case, you would certainly do that. For the long warning case, you might go to a, a non-neutral solution. Let me add a quick footnote to that. We call for the use of recycled space-based or space rocket nuclear weapons to do what Jim's talked about. As a citizen and a taxpayer, I'm waiting for the day when Edward Teller and all his crew at Lawrence Livermore, who are now technologically unemployed, will see the light and come around and endorse what we're proposing here today to recycle SDI into a Space Guard Command. That's what we call it, a Space Guard Command. Next question. We have another question? Yes, sir. Rather than getting into more of the political end, let's stay more in the technical end if we could, since this is a technical conference. Do we have any other questions from the audience for these two gentlemen? Deflection? Yes, Tom. Given the, the recent work in regards to the rotation of uh, asteroids and the possible composition of the rubble pile, is it, is it, how, how much, how many samples do we have to take before we get a good chance? Because we won't be able to sample the one we have to swap, if you know what I mean. There won't be time to sample whatever one we have to swap. What, what number do you think we would have to sample before we can be reasonably certain that we wouldn't be creating 10 gauge buckshot out of a rifle bullet? Okay, the question as I understand it is, what type of sample do we need to understand the probability so we can understand what we're dealing with? Jim, would you like to address that? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, you talk about statistics, which I describe as the science of ignorance. Uh, you really need to look at the particular one you're trying to zap if you have a chance. If you don't, this standoff Enhanced radiation weapon is the best thing we, that I know of at present. Uh, sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. Another question? Oh, what I'm going to ask you to do is wait, and when Mr. Garrels comes up, he's going to be on at 4 o'clock. He would be the perfect person to answer that, and he may need even answer the question in his presentation. May I answer it this way? Who discovered Comet Shoemaker-Levy? A Shakespearean scholar from Toronto, David Levy, and a geologist, Mr. Shoemaker. They were not astronomers, so yes, there's plenty of room for amateur astronomers. Yes, go back. Don't forget his wife. Yes. And his wife, certainly don't forget Carolyn by any means. We have a question here. So what is the various sizes of asteroids that could come into our atmosphere? Okay, the question we have is a question on size. What is the size that would be considered an asteroid? What would be considered an asteroid by size? Well, I'd give you the answer that anything that's in danger of hitting the Earth in large pieces, I'd consider an asteroid. That's something would be something larger than maybe 30 meters for a, a stony asteroid, all the way up to uh, Ceres, which is a thousand kilometers in diameter. So anything from 30 meters to a thousand kilometers would be considered an asteroid, I think. The meteor, Agnahito, which is here in the New York Museum of Natural History, is, is a, a, a considered by many a mini asteroid, and it's no bigger than from here over that wall. Meteors are considered by many astronomers as baby asteroids, so uh, if one hits, look out. I think I have time for one more question. Do I have another question from the audience? Yes, sir. There seems to be a lot of theories about what the explosions or other types of techniques might do to asteroids. Is there any way to test these things? I mean, can they even test them in a laboratory to some extent? And do you have to go out there or go try it out? Okay, we have a question on 
testing can and he's talking about the theories as far as blowing up the asteroids, etc. For myself, I would say until we have more samples, until we have a better idea of what the asteroid's composition is, there's no way to test it because we don't know what we're testing against. Let me suggest you repeat that question to Dr. Farquhar, who's got a mission on the way to look at the first one up close and personal. Uh, that'll give us some answers. There'll be more answers after that. I think we're out of time here, and I want to thank both of our, one of our speakers already left, but I want to make sure they get a, a warm thanks for a very fine job, and we hope to see you back here in about 10 minutes.